something that you know somebody could be there in the in the bushes to take you away. They don't know that at all, but um, anything can happen. Hitting the Jackpot was written and presented by Alan Bezik and produced in Manchester by Julia Shaw and Amanda Mayers. And the next programme in the series will be broadcast in the autumn. This is Radio 4. It's 8 o'clock. And our new series of analysis begins with the 1996 Analysis Lecture, delivered by Professor Paul Kennedy to an invited audience and chaired by Peter Jay. It's entitled... Globalization and its discontents. Hello and welcome to the 1996 analysis lecture entitled Globalization and its discontents. Globalization unites almost everyone in two ways. First, it scares them rigid, and secondly, they're not at all sure what it is. Roughly speaking, I suggest it means recent changes in the organization of the world economy, which tend to have the result that any entrepreneur anywhere can draw on savings accumulated anywhere and on technologies and managerial skills located anywhere to create a productive unit anywhere, employing local labor and selling its products anywhere to everyone. But there are complications. We couldn't therefore be more fortunate than we are in having our lecture tonight a man who can certainly tell us what globalization is and who is well qualified by a lifetime as an academic historian in the finest traditions of Edward Gibbon and Arnold Toynbee charting the rise and fall of civilizations to tell us just how scared we need to be. Paul Kennedy is one of those wise and lucky Englishmen who has for many years freely chosen to live and work in the United States. He was brought up on the Tyne in Newcastle and eventually migrated to the banks of the Quinnipiac in Connecticut, where he is Dilworth Professor of History and Director <coughs> of International Security Studies at Yale University. He's the author of The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, in which he predicted the decline, if not the fall, of the United States, and of preparing for the 21st century, which was received also as another work of deep pessimism. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kennedy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the message I will bring today will be, I hope I can persuade you to agree to it, uh, not totally pessimistic in tone, but sobering, uh, realistic, and a call to serious thought and action to deal with how globalization, that is the interconnectedness of capital, production, ideas, and cultures at an increasing pace, is to be handled by this country and other countries and other societies as we go into the 21st century. I'm not totally pessimistic because I'm going to admit from the beginning that while humankind as a whole engages in globalization, it prospers on the creation of a level global economic playing field. And many societies also prosper. But there is a downside on the other side that individuals, companies and other societies do not. And my argument will be that if the pace of change and intensity of the challenge is too severe, the number of those unable to compete might, in certain parts of the world, be dangerously large and lead to a political and ideological backlash. That the support given recently to Ross Perot, Pat Buchanan, Jean-Marie Le Pen, Zirinovsky, and the recent electoral landslides against the established parties in Canada, Australia, Italy, India, Poland and elsewhere are quite possibly tips of the iceberg of renewed nationalism and protectionism. And finally, that this phenomenon is an understandable reaction and should not be dismissed as some sort of cranky, backwards, know-nothing, jingoist activity. By contrast, the policymakers, the intellectuals, the media ought as in analysis programs, to be focusing upon how to respond sensibly, cooperatively, above all wisely, to this test. In a nutshell, and here's the proposition, one of the chief problems we face as we go into the globalized world of the 21st century is this. How do we reconcile 
the merging of the economic activities of 186 different nation states when their own socio-economic conditions are so varied when they are not on a level playing field. Now, it seems to me appropriate to raise this question in Great Britain because it was in these lands that the debate commenced a little over 200 years ago. And it was in Britain that not only the theory, but also the practice of free market policies was initiated. Its theologians were Adam Smith, Ricardo, and Cobden. Its manifestations were seen in the collapse of the protectionist system, the triumph of mid-Victorian capitalism, the global domination of British industry, shipping, services, the City of London, and in the imitation and attempts at catch-up by other societies in Europe, America, and elsewhere, however reluctant they were at first to abandon their established ways of life. Like all political and economic movements, laissez-faire capitalism produced a backlash. It created a different set of winners and losers from those under the guild system or the mercantilist system. And all who ha apprehended that they would become the new losers reacted in predictable ways. Moreover, these were not just sectoral reactions like the Luddites smashing agricultural machines or candlestick makers angered by the coming of gaslight. They were broader social concerns voiced by the political elites themselves, academics, the churches, about the damage to individuals and about the cruel conditions of those dark satanic mills that were beginning to blot the English and the Scottish landscape. Here was the question, was not total laissez-faire too harsh and too abrasive in its punishment of the less clever and the less competitive? Was it not just for those with sharp elbows? In consequence, as international capitalism grew and developed, it produced a series of responses. First, labor, the labor that had been brought in from the countryside to the towns and cities, began to organize itself in cooperatives, in insurance companies, and then in trade unions. Later on, labor would form its own political parties to protect their interests in the public sphere. Secondly, concerned liberals began to argue for the state to play a greater role in protecting workers and making them contented members of society through a package of measures like regulated workplace conditions, a minimum wage, health care, insurance, education, the whole to be paid for by redistributive taxation. This welfare statism, as it was soon to be called, was accompanied by a macroeconomic policy, Keynesianism, that sought to modify the ups and downs of the economic cycle. Its intentions were clear, to rescue capitalism from causing such severe periods of boom and then smash that the liberal economic order itself would be threatened. Nor was it only left to center groups who worried about the Darwinian conditions of the marketplace. Many a conservative thinker of the 19th and 20th centuries deplored the atomized, alienated world of modern man. Powerful papal encyclicals praised the dignity of labor and the need to protect it from unrestrained capitalism. These groups were worried, moreover, by the emergence on the very far left of Marxist and socialist movements that sought to pull down the whole system of social orders, private wealth, and privilege. Even the later phenomenon of fascism was, at least in part, another response, an extreme one at that, to the call to curb the excesses of bourgeois capitalism. If one looks at the early writings of Mussolini or whoever wrote for Mussolini, the attack is not upon communism so much as upon rampant laissez-faire bourgeois capitalism and the need to constrain it. In sum, throughout the past 200 years, we have witnessed a varied set of social, intellectual, and official responses to Smithian economics and the steady transformations in our material condition. Now, in 1996, 
now as the 21st century approaches, we are experiencing a further bout of globalization, which is faster moving, wider ranging, and more intense than anything yet experienced. This has a number of underlying reasons familiar to everyone here. First, the Marxist Soviet counter movement has collapsed in its own contradictions and by extension discredited a great deal of statist, socialist and Keynesian thought along with it. Privatization, the selling off of state enterprises and activities, is the order of the day. So that what an airline or a water company decides is, or some say should be, no longer the concern of governments. Secondly, the liberalization of exchange controls and money markets is allowing a vast flood of unanchored capital to move around the globe in search of promising investment opportunities. The amount traded on foreign uh, exchange markets each day is now about one trillion US dollars as it moves around. But as it moves around looking for those investment opportunities, it's also disciplining and punishing governments whose policies are unfriendly to free market operations. If the French government's budget deficits are too high, or the Japanese interest rates are too low, the market will show displeasure. If an emerging market country does not tempt investors with the right packet of inducements, it will not emerge. It's true, the world, especially the developing countries, need this capital. What I'm saying is it comes at its price. Thirdly, we have witnessed a communications revolution which permits ideas, blueprints, new inventions to be transmitted all over the world, at least to those who have access to the system. There's no longer status control in the world of ideas and culture and ideology, with very few countries as exceptions. Fourth, and this is the one I will belabor later in my remarks, great changes in production and assembly permit factories to be set up on the other side of the globe and to be turning out pretty well identical wares in record time. It took decades after the creation of the first factories in Britain for their equivalents to be established in parts of continental Europe or the United States. It probably takes less than two years for a Japanese or an American company to set up a brand new electronics components factory in Thailand, where hitherto they had just been jungle. In other words, the pace of technology transfer is so much faster than it was during the Industrial Revolution. Finally, a set of liberalized commercial regulations to be monitored by the World Trade Organization exerts pressure against those seeking native protectionism from this intensified competition. The playing field is therefore supposed to be level in all goods and services and is written into international treaty and organization that it has to be level, even though the condition of the actual players themselves may be very uneven and not level. It's clear that the results of all this are very good for the bankers, entrepreneurs and enterprises which can take advantage of a new game. And they've also brought, and they are bringing, many millions of new workers into the global marketplace and raising them from their extreme poverty. This is very evident in Southeast Asia and South Asia and parts of Latin America. Of that, there's no doubt. It has been beneficent to more than the few who run, pull the strings and invest the money. But my cautionary tale today, you remember, is entitled globalization and its discontents and it's to the more ominous possibilities that I wish to direct attention now. Let us employ a few statistics in considering the possible sheer dimensions of the problem that is looming ahead. According to professors Jensen and Fagan, who are both at the Harvard Business School, they are approximately 250 million workers in the United States and the European Union, currently earning about 85 US dollars a day. Most of them have also benefited from a post-1945 social contract 
specifically designed to avoid the class tensions and political extremism of the 1930s. You know what that social contract is, a package of things carried out by governments in the United States, France, Germany, this country, ensuring health care, insurance, pensions, and so on. But these workers in the North, or in the West, have been challenged already over the past several decades by the 90 million workers in Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, Singapore and Taiwan who found that they could increasingly produce automobiles, electrical goods, computers, textiles and other wares of equal quality though at far lower prices than could European and American workers. The result has been the transfer of certain industries like electrical goods, components industries out of Europe and out of much of North America. The result has been an enormous and a growing competitive economic pressure, especially upon countries like France and Germany with their high social wage. Though rather less so in this country, interestingly, because of Mrs. Thatcher's fight to keep the social wage low. But that fight, and whatever you think of it, offers little room for local satisfaction and congratulation. The biggest challenge is just emerging now. The move to market-oriented production in South America, Indonesia, India, parts of China and the rest of Southeast Asia that is taking place today is likely to put another 1.2 billion third world workers into worldwide product and labor markets over the next generation the vast majority of them currently earning less than three US dollars a day. Let me repeat that key sentence. The move to market-oriented production in South America, Indonesia, India, parts of China, and the rest of Southeast Asia that is taking place today is likely to put another 1.2 billion third world workers into worldwide product and labor markets over the next generation. And the vast majority of them are currently earning less than three US dollars a day. How on earth does one reconcile their interests, their quite legitimate interests, with those of the 250 million North American and European workers who earn 30 times as much? This represents, I would argue, an even more colossal depressive force upon real wages in the richer countries in the years to come. And professors Jensen and Fagan have gone out in saying that they believe such wages may tumble by as much as 50% in certain economic sectors over the next two or three decades. Although, being professors at the Harvard Business School, they are defenders of globalization and free markets, they concede that in the future they expect to see conflicts, great conflicts over international trade, breakdown of the international trading system in some areas, continued corporate downsizing under pressure of competition, the collapse in some countries of the post-1945 social contract, and even the failure of one or more Western democracies as extreme brands of political activism find their voice once again and rise up in a bid for control. They are not joking. Alas and alack, the majority of the economics profession nowadays appears to have no answer beyond saying that in the long run rising standards in the third world will make prosperous consumers of those 1.2 billion workers and their families, thus creating growing markets for Western goods. This begs the question to me of whether they will buy much from the West anyway, since their own factories established by Coca-Cola, Ford and the like, will supply much of what they want to buy. My guess is it will be the specialized producers of Europe and North America who will be able to respond to the rising standards of living elsewhere. If one is producing Glen Morangi Scotch whiskey, for which there is no equivalent, or Chateau Lafitte, the future looks good. 
but in a whole array of mass automated industrial production in North America and Europe, I think it looks a lot less good. But even if it was true that in the long term we would be creating this vast array of consumers who would then purchase products from Europe and North America, what about the short to medium term, the next 10 to 20 years, in both richer and poorer countries, as they struggle and perhaps fail to readjust? Will we not see mounting public discontent as political leaders grapple inadequately with the consequences of modernization and are rejected by angry electorates who turn to nationalist and fundamentalist alternatives, as in Russia, India, in part even in the United States, or to protectionist social welfare parties, as in Italy? What exactly do you do when you've got structural unemployment of 18%? possibly going up to 20 or 28 percent. The choices are hard. If, just to take one example, the German nation finds itself with the choice in a few years' time of the continued relocation of industry to lower wage countries so that Mercedes and Daimler-Benz and uh, BMW and Siemens can survive or severe cuts in the social wage so that it will be competitive in domestically located industry for export market, or a return to some forms of protection. Which way will it go? Which way will this country go? Which of the three hard choices would you recommend? And are you sure you know the answer after the surprises and the reverses in the past decade in international affairs. Who is putting his money on the table or her money on the table for what the international economic order, let alone the international power political order, will be in the year 2010? Placed in this broader context, it seems to me, from my transatlantic viewpoint, that the quarrels in the Tory party over Europe or in the Labour Party over trimming social services are petty by comparison. They are related to what I've been talking about, but they address some of the symptoms, not the cause of what is really going on. They have little, if any, sense of the broader forces at work here. They hardly seem to realize that in a globalized economy, the nation state and its government and its agencies and its ministries are less and less capable of delivering the goods we have come to expect from it. Nor, in case you think this is a critique from the left of center, nor is it any use, I feel, denouncing the multinationals themselves from moving production and jobs, since they are forced by the rules of the game, the rules of the open globalized market, to diversify and relocate, or to go under. It would be insulting your intelligence, ladies and gentlemen, to suggest that there is a single answer to a challenge as large and complex as this one. Perhaps, in fact, and some of you may wish to put this forward in our debate, perhaps, in fact, there is no answer, and we simply have to brace ourselves for what Schumpeter termed the creative gales of capitalism. Schumpeter was right. Capitalism causes turbulence. Or perhaps Marx, lying in his grave and at present almost universally scorned, has a slow smile creeping across his face as he sees the convulsions ahead. That would be the final and greatest irony of this 20th century of ours. Still, several things are worth suggesting. The first and the most important is the need to elevate our recognition of the size and significance of this problem, and especially to get our political leaders to put it at the forefront of both the national and the European debate, instead of pretending that if they are retained in office or elected to office, wonderful policies and solutions are at hand. Nor should this be a debate among the richer countries alone, for the developing world has perhaps an even greater stake 
in this issue and in the 21st century will make its voice known in a way it couldn't do 50 years ago or 100 years ago. But we can think positively, constructively about how to respond. If we can have global conferences about the environment, population, women, human rights, isn't it time to propose a world conference to establish a process for hammering out policies to deal with the challenge to all countries, rich and poor, from what may well be a too swift modernization and globalization. And a special plea. In the meantime, can't we find economists capable of addressing these issues and perhaps coming up with a new global Keynesianism, or whatever you want to call it, could be your name, ladies and gentlemen, instead of assuring us that things will be all right, hmm, eventually, and in the long term. In sum, this problem is big enough to warrant serious debate. It is not a new issue. The historians in this room and the economic historians know that. We must remember that the pros and cons of globalization and modernization were also furiously debated in the 1840s, the 1900s, the 1930s. We must also remember that they split entire political parties in each of those periods. So we have some precedents for the debate and the outcomes. But this time, the forces for change are so much larger, much more profound, and occurring much faster. Surely the least we can do is to strive to understand them and then talk about how we respond to them nationally, regionally, within Europe, and then globally. The only alternative is to continue to wear our collective blinkers and then, in perhaps the not-too-distant future, be taken by surprise at the sheer size and vigor of the storms ahead. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Professor Kennedy, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating lecture, which I think will force all of us to think very hard indeed about the political stability of a global economy, particularly in the face of the prospect that maybe after all capitalism will collapse under its own contradictions or if not anyway pose some very demanding questions for the managers of the uh, global system, particularly if they face the prospect of living standards in Europe and North America and Japan for the average working person falling by proportions approaching uh, 50%. Now we have time for questions. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes, please. David Butler, Nuffield College. You were worrying us about our future, but you didn't talk about population or energy or global warming and all those three things. I think worry me a little bit more when I worry about my grandchildren than the distribution of employment. Let me answer your point by reference to a seminar I attended in Frankfurt just three weeks ago where the, the topic of the seminar was will the German social system be able to withstand the pressure of global competition? And the Germans came in very pessimistic and they left so totally pessimistic I felt very anxious for having spoken and wondered if I would ultimately be called uh, one of the causes of the collapse of the, uh, another German democratic state. I reminded them in the midst of their pessimism that when the Harvard Business School professors Jensen and Fagan were talking about how do we reconcile the interests of the 250 million northern workers with the 1.2 billion emerging a third world G77 workers, if you look at global numbers, you realize there's another three or four billion left out of even that tension, even that polarity. They are the billions who are not even becoming emerging markets and a veiled prospect of being so. 
This is, I think, behind my argument that we need to deal with the economic tension and set up mechanisms there because as other countries rise in their prosperity and if we can achieve some reconciliation between the first economic world and the second economic group, it also will be our global duty to try to find ways of dealing with the resource depleted, overpopulated, totally hopeless countries across Africa, Central Asia and in some other parts of the world. So I guess my response to you is choose your global doom scenario and focus on it for yourself. In other <laughs> contexts I have focused upon population and environment and mass migration. Today I was just provoked to talk about uh, globalization and its discontents. It wasn't exclusive. There are other discontents. Baroness Hogg. Your key concern, if I hear you are right, is the entry into the global market of 1.2 billion very poor people. And as they enter, becoming richer in a real sense, in the sense of more productive. Thus, the world you're describing is a richer world. Now, while of course you're right to say that wealth and discontent can go hand in hand. Can I just test your pessimism by asking whether you would not at least agree that a richer world has at least the capacity to deal with its problems of outstanding poverty and suffering in other parts of the world better than a poor world? Oh, sure. There'd be no doubt about that. And you may recall I said almost in my second sentence that the process of globalization and modernization benefits the world economy as a whole if you measure the total wealth and the total, total output. And I don't doubt World Bank and other projections that you know, total world GNP or product as a whole, however you call it, will go from 20 trillion to 25 trillion US dollars in the next decade. The interesting thing is what happens within that cake. And I'm not sure whether, A, the large number, I still find 1.2 billion very difficult to swallow, the large number of those entering the global workforce and marketplaces pro producing for others, uh, as they rise from a measly three hour, three dollars a day, to 10 to 15 will pay much attention to anybody else and I doubt if those under the force of competition in Europe and North America will think of anything other than the loss of their social wage and the loss of their standard of living and I don't see that we have the mechanisms to translate the greater overall wealth into funnel some of it into the resources which will oil the wheels as they grind as we close the gap between the eighty five dollars a day people and the three dollars a day people that that still becomes something I have difficulty in seeing and uh, imagining that it will occur without considerable social turbulence. Thank you. Mark Damson. Is there not a more benign scenario in which the Southeast Asian economies, to name but one cluster, might eventually find that their citizens aren't happy with the sort of government-led, forced savings, heavily investment, R&D-led economy, and they become consumers like people in the West, the United States, and to some degree Japan, and that that massive gap that you describe between the wage levels here and the wage levels there will close so that the law of competitive advantage as it currently applies will be changed and changed again and other economies will take advantage of lower wage costs and it will be passed along as has been the case in history up to now. One group of countries emerges after another. Yes, I think there is a more favorable scenario and I think that when one goes into just incredibly booming societies like Singapore, you see it's already happened. You see, they have caught up, gone beyond Europe in some respects. My question is simply this. Uh, while I can see that happening with a select number of East Asian societies, 
usually located on trade routes and with a certain openness to ideas that are not political and constitutional but are business and entrepreneurial. Can it be done for the other four billion people on the planet in the next generation? When I talk to United Nations development officials now about the prospects of development in the light of the hostility of a U.S. Republican-dominated Congress, they say that isn't the only problem we face. Uh, the problem with development in, say, the General Assembly is that East Asia has killed off the development debate by developing itself. So there are very different patterns going on here. And I would concede your point, it could be a more favorable scenario, but I think it would be for a certain percentage of the nations and regions of the globe. David Haney, uh, I was rather surprised that your analysis failed to note that we had actually tried a protection during this period you're discussing before, in the 1930s, and that it was totally disastrous, and that it in fact revealed the protection was one of these cosy words, which doesn't mean what it appears to mean, because it means exposure, not protection. And uh, I'm surprised that you don't factor that analysis into your consideration in at least suggesting that there would be some tremendous costs to everyone, developed and developing, if we went down the protectionist road. Then I did not express myself clearly enough because the thrust of the lecture was not that there's this way to go or that way to go, but that we are possibly, to use an American phrase, between a rock and a hard place. That is to say, if there is this reaction towards protectionism, we will indeed suffer from many of the ailments which flowed from the protectionism of the 1930s. And not only we will suffer, but of course many poorer societies who were the worst hit in the 30s will be probably the worst hit again. But to say that the alternative to protectionism is this rising tide, this uh, effortless advance towards a globalized economy in which everybody is winners, which is the general message borne by, say, the Wall Street Journal, itself seems to me too naive. And therefore, what I'm doing today is, is to push again at this question. Is there any way in which we can pick the best of the two systems? Or do I have to spend so many of my dinner evenings in Yale University listening to a convinced free marketer on one side of the table and a, a protectionist manufacturer on the other, wondering if they can't see some middle course. Edward Certain, BBC, can we really accept, as you seem to, as a given, the idea that economic discontent will automatically mean political extremism? For example, you mentioned Jean-Marie Le Pen. The lesson of his failure, really, must be that even in a country like France, which has suffered quite badly from unemployment, there seems to be a lid on the sort of support unpleasant politicians can get. I'd like to answer that in two ways. One is, uh, of course, there's no obvious equation which says economic discontent equals fascism or whatever you think the extreme end of convulsion is. Though it's fair to say that we've seen many instances in the past 200 years of societies being pushed to the brink by economic discontent and apprehensions about the future. The second part would be more specifically to the issue of Jean-Marie Le Pen. I don't know how you know, the historians of France in 20 or 30 or 50 years' time are going to look at it. If, if these global pressures continue, and then the argument might be, well, seen in retrospect, Jean-Marie Le Pen was a, a first sense of French unease in the late 20th century, and what it did was to cause the French governments to move rightwards to become themselves much more st stark and harsh in their literature, to insist that they were repatriating immigrants, that they were going to be protecting French intellectual property, etc., etc., and that, in fact, while they dampened the fortunes of people like Le Pen, for a while, the further pressures by 2005 caused a swing back again. That's the hypothesis. That's the thing I'm pushing forward. Sir Michael. Michael Howard, uh, as you say, Paul, there's nothing new about this, and it's a debate and a threat which uh, has been going on since the early 19th century. 
Towards the end of the 19th century, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, we were all, or rather our parents and grandparents, were all desperately worried about low productivity costs in China or Japan and the Far East in general, which are undercutting wage costs in this country and in Europe, and the general belief that our economy is going to collapse as a result. Why didn't it? It didn't because we were still talking, I think, about a very limited percentage of people involved in the global manufacturing process, making products for others. Uh, Europe and North America, a bit of Australia and New Zealand, and some in Japan. It didn't also because, I would argue, the pace of growth was not as torrid and hectic as it has been coming out of East Asia these past 25 years and it didn't historically because they all started shooting at each other in 1914 as you know so well and then the debate went in a different direction and it's hard to disentangle the impact of the First World War from longer term economic trends which might have produced that kind of contraction or revulsion all I will say is that you and I and many others know the historical precedents and know the historical debates and know that there's very little new in the pro and con arguments about protectionism versus free trade and about globalization and modernization. I get the sense from the scientists and the biologists and the environmentalists and a number of other people I now listen to that we are approaching thresholds in a whole number of ways and it is not that what's happening is so different but that the number of people involved is so fantastically larger the amount of spare space in which these explosions could be absorbed is significantly less and the pace of change and the complexities of the interaction is so much more profound and I would love to sit back in 2035 as a doddering old man looking through old notes and things like this and say, my goodness, I just found this lecture that I gave to BBC radio analysis program in 1996 and look what I said and look how it didn't happen and how many of those in the audience cautioned against this diagnosis. I hope you're right. Larry Woods. Yes, I wonder where international institutions are in your analysis. Surely this is one way that governments have tried to deal with the interconnectedness that you describe. Is your view of their prospects so gloomy that you neglect them? No, perhaps I didn't give enough attention to international institutions because I've just come across the Atlantic from a society and a country and a polity which, though it did wonderful things to create international institutions between 1943 and 49 now regards the word itself as uh, as liquid poison but on the contrary I think that if one is talking about what are the possible intelligent cooperative responses to pressures and uh, developments of this kind then it has to be through a, through a set of international cooperative bodies and agencies. Perhaps the present ones are inadequate for that. I've just come off a three-year study on the United Nations in its second half century, which looked at some of this, these global trends and looked at the performance of the UN and declared that you know, the eco-sock of the General Assembly designed for such grandiose tasks it's so totally hopeless we should scrap it and think about something much more powerful, much more empowered with uh, mechanisms, cooperative coordination, able to bring in the Bretton Woods agencies and many others and talk through what it is to be done. Now, Professor Kennedy, in conclusion, might I put it to you that there is perhaps a disproportion between your diagnosis, which is potentially very grave and tells us that at least the majority of the working people in the rich countries of the world, North America, Europe, Japan, could face uh, up to a 50% reduction uh, in their living standards with 
obvious consequences perhaps for the political stability of those countries and therefore for the globe which depends on those countries and on the other hand you offer us a conference a conference to discuss what is to be done as your final contribution could you tell us something about the agenda for that conference sure i was waiting for the killer question to come at the end bear in mind my words were that something like that would begin the process of talking through what are the various instruments and what are the various responses and what are the various standpoints north and south east and west to deal with an issue as big as this one when India comes to such a global north-south conference its agenda will be very very different from Germany's and Germany's will be very very different from that of the United States and therefore for me to kind of prescribe the exact contents and outcome of the debate would be rather silly Mr. Kennedy I thank you very much The 1996 analysis lecture, Globalization and its Discontents, was presented by Paul Kennedy and introduced by Peter Jay. The producer was Nicola Merrick.